Okay, I'm going to start the recording now. Thanks so much, everybody. Hopefully you can see and hear me and everything is all right, technically on your side. Um, we're going to start our second uh, GAD session this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about <laughs> drafting, which is a really exciting but important and drudging part of the writing process. Um, I'm going to briefly just introduce myself because we have quite a few more uh, people joining us this morning than were with us last time we did our little video um, series. So um, I'm Abby, or Abigail Mokra. I am um, a doctoral student at the Department of English and American Studies at Maastricht University, obviously. And um, I also work at the Language Center with my colleague and uh, partner in crime, Joe Lennon. And um, we teach some courses about writing, although Definitely he teaches far more courses about writing than I do. And I'm not gonna go into my, um, let's say academic background because I don't wanna take too much time away, but maybe I'll just turn it over to Joe for a second and you can introduce yourself briefly. Yep, I will do that. Um, a couple of people in the chat are saying they aren't seeing video, I guess, but then one person says that they are. So mm -hmm. it might be, those of you who can't see, yeah, maybe it's something with your program because it looks like others can see. So uh, you guys can work that out in the chat while I introduce myself. Uh, I'm Joe. Um, I'm Abby's colleague in the uh, Masaryk University Language Center. Uh, Abby and I have been uh, working recently with starting uh, what we call the Writing Lab. It's based on uh, writing centers, which are at universities all over the world, but for some reason not so popular in uh, Central European universities yet. There are a few. We're trying to change that, and the Writing Center is a, a place where um, students, teachers, um, anyone in the Masaryk University community can come and uh, get writing advice and face-to-face, um, -face, <laughs> uh, hopefully, help with your, with your writing. Um, yeah, my background is in creative writing, but I've, I've uh, been a teacher of creative writing and academic writing for several years. So that's a quick background for me. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, it looks like people are getting advice in the chat about the technical side of things. So um, I hope that that uh, works out for you. Uh, we would appreciate it, I believe, uh, if you are willing to show your face to us. It always is nice for presenters and teachers to s actually see people in this corona world. So if you are willing, uh, if you don't... Uh, have you know crazy morning hair and are willing to let us see you uh, then please uh, turn on your video if not that's fine um, okay I will turn it back over to Abby who's going to introduce our this the the text uh, that sort of um, inspired the slightly uh, possibly rude sounding title of our um, talk today. So I'll turn it over to Abby. Yeah, it looks like everything should be going um, well for most people. Um, although, thanks to Petr Vellen for pointing out that somebody, or I as the host, I need to set my video feed as the default. So if anybody can let me know how to do that. I'm a little bit new to Zoom. I'm not a Zoom sleuth by any term of the word so um, if I haven't done something correctly I'm I apologize for that I don't see a easy option for me to set my video as the default um, however if somebody knows feel free to jump in unmute yourself and interrupt me and let me know what I'm doing wrong otherwise um, if it's all right I'm gonna go ahead and start with the you know seminal text of, of drafting which is what this Gab is all about. Maybe Joe, if you don't mind, you can monitor the chat a little bit to to help out. Yeah, I'll see what I can do about the video. I'm not sure either. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. 
I'm going to share my screen. We have our lovely Zoom meeting here. <laughs> By the way, while Abby is doing that, I'll just, just to briefly uh, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to both introduce, um, we're going to introduce two texts to you, which we often give students. Um, and the, the theme of these texts is the, the idea of um, writing first drafts and maybe writing shitty first drafts or writing badly when we start. And this is a key concept. Um, so we're, and we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to share with you uh, our own, in the spirit of, of um, modeling for you uh, the writing process, we're going to show you examples of our own shitty first drafts that eventually became successful, we hope, uh, essays. So to show you um, some of that. Then we will open it up and we can have a conversation with all of you about anything that came up or anything that you are wanting to uh, know about or talk about with writing. Okay, so. Thanks so much, Joe, for introducing that. I'm trying to do a few things at once, like figure out the technical side and let people in. So yes, shitty first drafts, we're gonna start off with a little bit of a rude title, as Joe mentioned, but it is um, an excerpt from Bird by Bird from Anne Lamott, and I've made a really, really brief um, just slideshow because I wanted to highlight the parts of the text that I thought would be most beneficial for all of you. So, so whew, too quickly. Let's see if I can move this. Haha, -ha, I can. Voila. Shitty first drafts. Here we go. So the first part I wanted to focus on, I've highlighted in yellow so that you can follow along with me when I'm reading. I, of course, I'm not going to read these longer chunks of the, the paragraph that I've cut in for, for you here in this presentation. But the, the main messages, again, I just wanted to highlight for you. So very few writers, Anne says, really know what they're doing until they've done it, right? And then again, if you jump down, we often all feel like we're pulling teeth even those writers whose prose ends up being the most natural and fluid, the right words and sentences just do not come pouring out like ticker tape or rapidly most of the time. The first draft, she says, is the child's draft, the, the draft in its infancy, where you kind of let it all pour out and then romp all over the pace, all over the place, I'm sorry, running around, crazy, chaotic. No one's going to know it. No one's going to see it and you can shape it however you would like later. You can kind of mold it after you get everything out onto the page. She says, just get it all down on paper because there may be something great in those six crazy pages that you would never have gotten to by a more rational and grown up means, meaning by trying to take control of what you're really writing as you're putting it down onto the page. She says, there may be something in the very last line of the very last, last paragraph on page six of all that rambling that you just love, that is so beautiful or wild, but you know what you're supposed to be writing about now, more or less, or in what direction you might go. But there was no way to get to this first without getting through the first five and a half pages of rambling, shitty writing, if I can use her term again. So. How she'd do it, she starts to explain her process a little bit briefly. She'd sit down and try to write a lead, but instead she'd write a couple of dreadful sentences and then feel despair and worry settle in on her chest like an x-ray apron, those kinds of heavy, heavy aprons they put on. It's over, I'd think calmly. I'm not going to be able to get the magic to work this time. I'm ruined, I'm through, I'm toast. So this is the denial period of I'm never gonna be able to sit down and write this. It's never gonna sound good. It's never gonna look good. My professor's gonna hate whatever I put out. I'm never gonna wanna publish this. This is awful. Yeah, we all go through these feelings, even Anne Lamott. And she says, every time that she would try to get herself back into the process, she would stare into some kind of one inch picture frame of inspiration for her. And every time the answer would come, all she had to do was write a really shitty or terrible 
if we can call it what it is, a really terrible first draft of say the opening paragraph and nobody was going to see it. So she'd start writing without reining herself in, without any kind of control. And it was almost just typing, just making fingers move on a keyboard and the writing would be terrible and we would all expect it to be terrible on purpose. Because after that time, eventually, if you can get your fingers going, if you can get into the habit of it without with removing this kind of mental block, this fear and terrible voice in our head, by then, she says, she had been writing for so long that she would eventually just let herself trust the process or let it kind of come out and flow out sort of more or less. She'd write a first draft that was maybe twice as long or terrible, twice as terrible as it should be with a self-indulgent and boring beginning. Yeah, and I'm gonna continue on. And the next day she would kind of sit down after she had taken a breather, taken a break, gotten up and walked away from it. And she'd go through it all with a colored pen and take out everything that she could, possibly could, possibly hated. She might find a new lead or a new first sentence on the second page or the sixth page. And she might find a kicky or edgy or cool way to end it. And then she might call that done and write that as the second draft. And then later, she might start to rewrite it as a third draft. So she'd come back about a month later and also, again, each time she has to begin a new thing, she mentions, it starts with the fear that people will find my first draft before I can rewrite it. So essentially, going from draft to draft to draft, she wants to kind of close with the idea that almost all good writing begins with terrible first efforts. You have to start somewhere, usually terribly, start by getting something, anything down on paper, a friend of hers uh, said that the first draft is called the down draft. You have to just get it down. And the second draft is called the up draft. You fix it up and you try to say what you have to say a little bit more accurately. And then the third draft is the dental draft. It's where you kind of check every tooth, every small or micro detail to see if it's loose or cramped or decayed or even perhaps God help us healthy, which by that she means it should stay in the kind of final draft. So I wanted to kind of end it with a funny little meme that the main message is, again, nobody's going to read your shitty first draft. And it's such a necessary part of the writing process to kind of sit down and get every kind of idea you have out onto the page. Because the first and the only way to start is just to start. And the first draft is not about getting it right. It's about getting it written. So thank you for listening to me ramble about that. Perhaps I'm going to turn it over to Joe now for our second set, if that's all right. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Joseph, you're muted. Unmute you, perhaps. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, you're unmuted. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Abby. Uh, so, oh, I have. Um, perhaps everybody who's not speaking, just for the moment, if you could mute your mic to avoid any. Yeah, um, please, if you're not speaking can you mute your mic okay can you okay hopefully everybody can hear me now um uh yeah so um uh, as i said earlier um uh i always give my students uh the text that abby just shipped my writing students i always give them the text that um abby just showed you shitty first drafts by Anne lamott i'm going to show you another uh text that i give students um, and it has a similar theme, but it, it's coming from a slightly different perspective. Um, so let me share my screen. Oh, I haven't done this on Zoom yet, so give me one second. Desktop one is probably, yes. Am 
my goodness. Okay, I have to give it. Did you find a little button at the very bottom of the Zoom? Here we go. Okay. Our screen. Hopefully this works now. Actually, I wanted to. Okay, can you see now yep. something from me on the screen? Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, sorry. I hadn't done this on Zoom, so it, you know, it sent me all these system preferences and permissions stuff. Wait, you can probably see that actually. No, don't worry. We can only see the tab that you're on. But yeah, okay. Of us are um, proficient with Zoom, so we're doing our best. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for your patience, everybody, because um, we're all sharing is being paused. Okay, you can see hopefully a page from The Guardian here. Okay, actually, so I, I lied. I'm not gonna uh, show you the text by Ballinger yet because I wanted to show you first something that um, Anne Lamott says in her, uh, in her essay and which Abby quoted for you. I wanted to, it reminded me of something that the novelist uh, George Saunders He's giving a quotation from another writer. <laughs> um, and uh, somewhere it's in here and it and it's again uh, along the lines of this. Yeah, I love this. This uh, line from Donald Barthelme, who's a, a writer. The writer is that person. This was his definition of the writer. The writer is that person who embarking upon her task does not know what to do. I love that line. Um, and again, I think the reason why uh, Abby and I emphasize all of these quotations and all these essays in our, in our classes is because we've had so many students um, and the writers of these essays also had so many students who um, were really anxious about writing. And the, it, it um, often comes from this feeling that I have to perform perfectly the first time. I have to turn in some beautiful first draft that will impress my uh, teacher and, uh, and impress me and, and show me that I, I'm a great writer. And if I don't do that, I, I feel like, oh, I didn't succeed. I didn't um, create the masterpiece that I had in my head. And of course, the point, um, it should be clear, but I think it's not always clear is that that's a fantasy. <laughs> no, no writer uh, just sits down to write and or goes up to a mountaintop and has inspiration and writes the, the most brilliant poem in the world or the most brilliant essay in the world. Um, and I love that Daniel, uh, Do, sorry, Donald Barthelme defines the writer as the very person who doesn't know what to do. <laughs> that's, that's his definition. So not only uh, do uh, you know, beautiful masterpieces come naturally, but um, there's no there's no way that you you can start uh, that you can be a writer if you already have all the ideas in your head and you just magically put them down on paper. So there's this idea that the writing process is actually a way of thinking, right? A way of refining your ideas and and realizing what you want to do and what you want to say. So, and, and uh, I think the, unfortunately, uh, I hear from many students as well who tell me, I, I ask them, okay, you know, do your, have your teachers in the past ever given you a chance to rewrite things, revise things, do it a second time? And they say, well, no, we're just supposed to turn in a paper and it's just supposed to be great and there's no chance of revision. So, and I think that unfortunately, um, uh, creates this message even strong, even more strongly that, uh, okay, you're just supposed to do it the first time, do it perfectly. And um, so what Abby and I do in our writing classes is we always <laughs> incorporate the writing process in it. The students write, uh, um, you know, three, two or three or even more drafts. Um, and we see them and, um, you know, accept the sort of the shittiness of the draft. Um, and let me, so let me go now to, 
the, um, the importance of writing badly, which was the text that I wanted to share with you. And that is here. Uh, do you see something different now or? No, you still see the no, same thing. No, we see your same tab. I have to, I guess, let you also see my goodness. If you do share. Screen Aha. Screen. Yeah. Oh my God. You can uncheck the screen and click share your entire desktop because, ah, there you go. Did I do it? Okay. Do you see the importance of writing badly there by Bruce Ballinger? By the way, we'll, when we, when we, towards the end of the session, we'll uh, um, put some of these um, uh, texts uh, in the chat so you can have the title and author and copy and paste it and find them on your own. Anyway, what I love about this essay is it's very short. <laughs> so students uh, love to read it because it's only less than a page. Um, again, uh, Ballinger is saying a very similar thing to, to uh, Lamott. He's, uh, and he's coming from a place of personal experience. He's a teacher, just like she is. And, um, and what, his, uh, what his pet peeve is, what he hates are these teachers who are, as he says, hovering over students' papers, ready to find uh, a comma splice, a vague pronoun reference, a misspelled word, and they're ready to circle it in red and, and uh, make the student uh, see their errors, right? And he says, this is a horrible way to, um, to teach writing. Um, and what he says is, his, what he wants to do is get his students to write badly. <laughs> um, because, you know, again, we're, the, the problem is not these, you know, minor little mistakes and, and uh, sentence errors, grammar errors. And that's especially true. And this is why this is so important for English learners, because not only are you learning how to write, but you're learning how the language works. And so if a teacher is uh, jumping on every single grammar error, every single punctuation error that you're making, um, then uh, they're missing the point. And that is to, that, and the point is that writing should be uh, communication, sharing your ideas. And if, if, you, if the teacher is sort of <laughs> making you feel embarrassed that you can't even write a single sentence, uh, that's obviously not the way to get, get the good ideas out. So I'll just share this little quote from you, uh, sorry, from, for you from Ballinger. Can you see my yellow bubble there, hopefully? Uh, when I give my students permission to write badly, to suspend their compulsive need to find the perfect way of saying it, often something miraculous happens. Words that used to trickle forth come gushing to the page. The students quickly find their voices again. And even more important, they're surprised by what they have to say. They can worry later about fixing awkward sentences. First, they need to make a mess. So he's saying exactly the same thing that, um, that Lamott is saying, um, that uh, there needs to be, um, the pr you need to think about the proper process. If you think, okay, the first priority is to get my grammar right, then hmm, it's not gonna work because <laughs> that's gonna take you years, <laughs> right? as an English learner, um, especially, you know, as, as Czech and Slovak students, many of you know, especially articles, right? Horrible things and commas. These are all things I'm sure you're aware, you know, that are different in English than, um, than in Czech or Slovak. So if you're focusing on these things, you're never going to get to the good stuff. And that is your ideas, your, um, the words that you need to find to, to express uh, the things you want to say best. So um, just, uh, just a short little, another example is so many times, and I'm sure Abby, you can confirm this, so many times I read 
papers submitted by students and it's filled with uh, beautiful academic words. Um, furthermore, moreover, uh, all these uh, exciting, beautiful, fancy words, um, but it makes no sense. It's nonsense. Um, and it's because I think the students were trying to trying to sound professional, trying to sound perfect, using all the beautiful, wonderful words that they know, but not actually <laughs> realizing, okay, first I just have to get my basic idea out and it doesn't matter how I do that, what words I use. So sometimes what I say to students when I get that paper, paper like that is say, ho hopefully I have them face to face at this point uh, or in this new world, I have them on a screen, computer screen, and I say, okay, put down your paper, tell me in the most natural words what you want to say here. And they say, oh, okay, well, my point is just that uh, this is really hard to do and we need to do it a different way. And I say, uh-huh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Now I know exactly what you were trying to say. So I put that down on the paper. And they say, oh yeah, but that's not like an academic way of saying it. That's not the, the, the way that you know, I've seen in papers. And I say, well, I know, but uh, start with that. Then you're communicating. You're starting to say things that uh, you want to communicate to other people. Then you can go back and say, okay, let's make this uh, fancy. Let's make this academic. Um, and, but without that, that first sort of, if we can say, shitty or embarrassing or unprofessional way of saying something, you're never going to get to the the professional, the finished draft. So that is the message of Lamott, the message of Ballinger. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Abby and we're gonna share with you our shitty first drafts, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Just to build on that comment, when, when students, I have the same kind of um, experience, Joe, uh, that you have and uh, oftentimes, when students say, yeah, but that doesn't sound academic enough. I ask them to tell me what, well, what does academic mean to you? Because mm -hmm. can anybody actually understand what it is you've written here? Even I have to read this sentence three to five times to try to understand or break down what it is you're trying to say. Whereas you can explain it to me in, in words so much more simply. So. You have to find that kind of balance in between using this sophisticated, eloquent, you know, vocabulary or high diction and also making sense academically because the point of academia is to educate or we want to convey or share our ideas. And if nobody can understand what we're saying, it's essentially kind of kind of pointless. But uh, what I really like to do now is uh, in the spirit of uh, solidarity, I want to show you one of my shitty drafts. Um, and this is a really kind of short run through I made of a draft in progress of a piece of uh, writing. It's creative writing, of course, because I, this is really what I spend the most time modifying, you know, more recently. Um, but I wanted to show you exactly how many revisions it goes through before I ever feel like, okay, maybe I will let somebody look at it now. So this is essentially a really short video of 168 frames of a living draft. See how much it builds and changes over time and the structure completely changes. It's crazy how fast it starts going, but it gets really long, really short, and you can see the changes in blue. So sometimes it's a small change, sometimes it's deleting the entire paragraph, sometimes it's reorganizing and putting what was at the end at the beginning, or at the beginning at the end, or in the middle. Sometimes it's changing the, the punctuation, some fancy pauses, giving some titles. Sometimes it's deleting an entire page of what I've written. It's never really the easiest thing to get 
a draft out or get it complete, sometimes it goes through more than just the three drafts that Anne Lamott mentioned. For me, this particular piece of writing went through 168 different very <laughs> like modifications essentially before I was ready to show it. And this is uh, what the final draft kind of looks like now, as you'll see. It has a more final-ish structure, but it varies, it differs completely from what it started out as when you look down here and some of the very first kind of copies. And this is really an act of vulnerability as a writer showing you all of the sentences I didn't want you to see, all of the things that Anne Lamott tells you nobody's ever gonna see when you put them down on paper. So deleting, adding, as I go on, So this is my draft process. I'll come back, maybe the same day I'll make 20 revisions. Maybe one day I'll make one revision, one edit. And a revision, oh, I'm sorry, I stumbled on my word. A revision can be just changing a few words. It can be rewriting an entire paragraph. It can be adding an entire new chunk of pages or new chunk of text to your draft. But progress is always progress, regardless of how much is actually changed. You should still kind of walk away with, in my opinion, or I try to, to teach students, you should walk away with the feeling or the sense that today I've modified my draft, I've looked at it, I've, I've tried to put a little bit of myself into it today. Because it doesn't always have to sit down and flow out of you from start to finish, okay, this is my first draft. And then the next day, okay, I've modified all this, this is my second draft, yeah? So you'll see that by the end, it looks completely different from what it looked like in the beginning. And I have hundreds, more than just the frames, hundreds of revisions over here that I've made before it's even at a point where I would show it to somebody else. The current version, let's say. And I do the same thing actually for a lot of the, let's call them academic papers I write. But really what I mean by that is the purpose is to maybe analyze the text and the audience is going to be my professor or my advisor or whomever I'm writing it for in, in university. I do the same kind of thing with my, with my essays or papers or theses or I don't know, analyses or whatever I might be writing for that given professor, I draft in literally the same way. I sit down, I start prose vomiting out what it is I think I wanna say about this kind of text. Maybe I'll even scribble around my text, but that's something I think for Joe a little bit later. And I'll try to annotate it, or I'll try to put some of the author's words into my draft and I'll let it go and I'll let it go. But the drafting process is usually really slow for me. And I'm a PhD student of literature, so I'm quite used to, by this time in my academic career, writing many papers and writing many, many drafts. So I'm not gonna bore you too much longer with this version of my draft. I think you saw how pedantic and crazy I am when it comes to changing and modifying. Now, baby, I'm gonna let Joe show his version of one of his drafts. Joe? I'm going to unmute you. I feel like I have the power as the meeting host to do all these things, but it's too much power for me because I'm monitoring participants coming into the meeting, unmuting. Yeah. Let's go for it. Oh, Abby, you got a very, you got a very sweet comment from uh, Demetrio there that you have great patience and perseverance. That's nice. Thanks. Thanks, Demetrio. Yeah. Are you referring to the thousands of different versions? <laughs> Not being <laughs> Thank you for that, though. That's sweet. Yeah, but um, I mean, I agree. And that's, I mean, again, that's the point that uh, obviously we're focusing on uh, drafting and shitty first draft as a liberating, as a freeing experience, right? If, you, if you're feeling, uh, you know, like you're blocked or you're trapped because you have to do something uh, perfectly, it might be a nice feeling to know, okay, even great writers, uh, you know, write shitty first drafts, screw up and have to redo things. On the other hand, it, we have to acknowledge that it's also, you know, it, it might 
seem uh, a little bit disheartening too, to know that that's the process, that it's gonna take hundreds, thousands of uh, drafts and hours to, to create good writing. Again, all we can hope for, well, all we can do as writing teachers is to try to allow students more space for that. And all you can do as writer is also allow yourself space for that. So real, you know, realize that it's gonna be a process um, and give yourself that time. And don't feel bad about giving yourself that time. Like, oh, I'm wasting time. You're not wasting time. You're, you're um, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. But you have to realize that it's gonna take time. So don't, <laughs> don't start writing that essay, that uh, 5,000 word essay uh, the night before going to be um, not what you want it to be. But you know that. Okay, um, I, I'm going to show you something a little bit different. It's not really a first draft of um, anything that I've done, but it is the very, very like proto first draft, the little baby steps that I uh, started taking in, in writing an essay. This is uh, for my PhD written exams. I had to, um, uh, I, I could choose the topic, but I didn't know what the question would be from my professors. I, so I had to spend the summer reading uh, a bunch of books, and then I would get a question from my, uh, from my professors, and I had to answer it in an essay, you know, what I think 10 page essay. So that was a sort of unique writing task. In, in this case, I really didn't, like, like Bartholomew said, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, so I just wanted to show you my notes because, and, and um, again, this is part of the process. Uh, I, I literally couldn't just sit down and be inspired and start writing. I had to take notes so that when I got the question from my professor, I would be able to sort of improvise and, and um, um, create an essay. But, but what I had to do then is sort of start to guess maybe what the questions I was, I was going to get and sort of anticipate that. And as I read, start to build an idea of at least a theme, right, that I could possibly use. So you might enjoy this because the, the topic that I chose for my PhD exams was check fiction, 20th century Czech fiction. Uh, obviously, uh, I wish I could read it in the original, um, but uh, uh, I couldn't. So I, this was sort of Czech fiction in translation. Um, so I had to read a bunch of everything I could find in translation uh, from Czech fiction and try to um, create a, a set of notes that, would, that I could then use on the exam. So, Let's see if this works. Okay, do you see a, pa a page there with, um, okay. What I, I, I actually uh, show this to students often, even though, again, like Abby said, it's sort of embarrassing. It's, it, a lot of it doesn't make sense. It's just my personal notes. It's not uh, academic yet. Um, However, maybe, maybe you could say it is academic only in the sense that what it's building from, and this is, I wanted to show you this because this is another way to build a, a draft, is it starts with quotations. And I've highlighted the quotations in uh, orange, just to show you. And then my words or my, um, in some cases, citations for the sources are in uh, black, right? And I have some links. Anyway. This is the, I thought it was funny. Um, it starts with a, a quotation from uh, Magda, who actually was my girlfriend at the, at the time. Um, and she was talking about, uh, um, uh, what a, I just realized I lied to you. She wasn't my girlfriend at the time. <laughs> she was her, I know that's not important, but she was my, my ex-girlfriend already. But, but anyway, I was talking with her and she, um, she made this uh, comment about how Czech students learn history. 
and I love this, at, this, at basic school, we got to President Masaryk Benesh, then the big hole, and Václav Havel. <laughs> um, and she was sort of describing this idea that in, uh, that in her edu in, in school, there was this mysterious uh, hole where the communist period was that they didn't seem to learn about. And, and that, what I wanted to show, show you that for is to show you how sort of funny, stupid, non-academic that is. I mean, obviously I knew I wasn't going to be using a quotation from my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend in my essay. And yet when she said that, and when I wrote it down, I realized that there was some idea that actually was useful in talking about what was happening in um, Czech fiction in the 20th century. And w I ended up using that idea in the final essay. And another, these are, this is other ideas that I end up using in the final essay. These images of time being manipulated in weird ways. Uh, most of you know the, the metronome that sits up on the top of the uh, Letna Hill in Prague the clock in the Jewish quarter that turns counterclockwise. I started collecting these images of time, uh, clocks moving in sort of way. And to me that, that came to represent this sort of, I could talk about a sort of Czech view of time, a sort of twisted, humorous, surreal view of time. Um, anyway, just to briefly show you, I mean, this goes on for pages and pages, but I, I just wanted to show you this as another model for how you could start a draft. Notice that I have quotations and then I start to, what I start to do is to write around the quotations. So I use the quotations and I start to say, okay, Kafka was doing this and I'm making notes around it. And eventually, even though this is so far from what the essay eventually became, it's, it's the beginning. Obviously I knew no one, or I thought no one would ever see this. <laughs> then I became a, a teacher. Uh, but um, anyway, again, uh, an example of a mess. It's a total mess. I mean, no, you know, I wouldn't expect anyone to read this and, and make any sense out of it. It was for me. It was just for me. Um, but it was very important because it helped me start to build the ideas that, was go that would go in the final essay. So let me just show you the, the final essay, um, which hopefully you can see that. And oh, it looks so nice, doesn't it? Um, this, just if you were curious, this was the, the, uh, the prompt or the question that I ended up getting from my professor. And you could say I was lucky, but I'd like to say instead I was, I was smart in a way by, by creating those notes in that way because eventually it turned out I could use those ideas that I was building from the notes in my essay. He asked, he asked me to write about the genial surrealism of Czech writing. Even Kafka laughed wildly at his own fiction. So this kind of surrealism, absurdism, um, and uh, anyway, I'm not obviously going to go into the essay, but I just wanted to show you again something that seemed like it might be very uh, non-academic, very casual, very um, ridiculous, but uh, it ended up um, turning into something. Aha, I'm, Hannah tells me you can't see the final text, is that? We see your notes still. Maybe you could close this file and open the other. I one. see. This is Zoom. This works very strangely. Like I don't know how I can just share my. Yeah, I see now. So, desktop one. Oh, okay. This should work. On um, on Teams and on Skype, I think it just like shows you your whole screen, and you can switch windows. How about that? Does that, did that work? Okay, I'm really sorry. So I'm sorry if you got lost there. Anyway, this is the final, what you see now should be the, the final essay that I wrote and that I turned in. And I guess it was successful. I passed my PhD exams. Um, anyway, um, I won't repeat everything I said. Hopefully 
um, it's enough to, to, again, to reiterate the point that um, what, what seemed like a sort of mess, a piece of garbage <laughs> from, a, from a perfectionist point of view, from an academic point of view, something that would not be acceptable, right? But it turned into something that was academic, that was successful. Um, and that's the point, right? That's if we leave you with any point is that um, this is writing is a process. As Abby wrote, it's a mess as well. It's a shitty, shitty mess until it's not. <laughs> and then, um, and I guess another thing that I can add there is, uh, I, that, that's why I always ask my, oh, let's see, I'll put myself back here so you can see my beautiful face. Okay. Um, I always um, ask the students in my class to write three drafts. Uh, and if we had longer time, I might ask for more, but in, within, a, within a semester, uh, three drafts of the final um, term paper that they're gonna write and they turn in each draft. And that's such an amazing process to witness because some, some magic always happens from the second and the third draft, especially. First drafts, you know, not good. I mean, they're not good. What can, there's no other way to say it. They're, they're confusing. They are, uh, you know, the, the um, quotations are in the wrong place or, or the citations are in the wrong place. Everything's messed up. Second draft, some things get fixed and it starts to look more like a thing, but, uh, you know, still, maybe not, not clearly something that the student uh, feels proud about. And then some, something happens there between the second and third draft um, that uh, always surprises me. Well, it doesn't surprise me much anymore, but it always surprises the students who've never paid attention to this process, this fact that things uh, get better if you keep working on them, keep revising them. Okay, I'll stop there. And now I'm, I think, uh, unless Abby, unless you have some final comments, we'll, we'll open it up and we'd like to hear your, your ideas, your questions. But Abby, I'll, I'll let you. Drafting say. is a mess, but it's also a process. So um, maybe now we have, I think a whole 28 people and perhaps one is still joining people with us today, which is awesome. Uh, we want to hear what are your problems and concerns with drafting? What do you face what are your experiences we've blabbed on and on enough um maybe we could give you some insight or help so um whoever would like to ask a question you can use the the raise hand function or you can just unmute and we'll kind of see how it goes from there or it doesn't have to be a question either sharing your your experience or your frustration or your concerns as well um or your or your happy stories of revision things that um, that became successful for you after you worked on it. So, maybe I can start the awkward silence. Who hates starting to write a draft? You can either unmute yourself and say, yeah, absolutely, it's terrible, or you can shake your head, yeah, if you have your camera muted. Oh, you don't hate it? Uh, wait, Abby, can yeah. you, un I think you might need to unmute everybody. I think you have everybody automatically. Um, people should be able to unmute themselves, but oh, okay. I mean, why not? I can unmute people. <laughs> I'll unmute everybody and then we'll have a party of audio artifacts. <laughs> yeah um in general i think you should be able to unmute yourselves can somebody who would like to speak try to unmute themselves so i know whether or not it's a problem on my end or your end maybe hannah could you try uh, to unmute yourself and see uh, if it's me who holds the, the power, the keys to the kingdom, or that's so bizarre. I think it is you. Unmute all, unmute all. 
Nice, nice. It's working now. Now it's working. <laughs> now everyone can mute themselves and then they can unmute themselves again. <laughs> okay. So please, please, if you have something to say, unmute yourself. If you are uh, just listening, then temporarily mute yourself so that we don't get echo. And I actually don't know how to raise a hand in Zoom, but I would have a question for you, Joe, or to Abby as well. Uh, because I kind of do my drafts the similar way as uh, Joe. I'm, I, I try to do the the citation or the quotations. And um, but since I started working on my thesis, diploma thesis, I do have a document with like 20 pages of those little notes. And either it's a quotation or it's a note within the quotation or something. And then I have 20 pages of that. And then I'm trying to put something out of that into another document but I keep going like every I'm just scrolling through the pages and suddenly um, I, I can't really remember what was on the first page and, the, and on the 20th page and it's a really big mess and I started color coding like the ideas that I, I try to do like, um, like some basic ideas and I color, color coded them but still, I don't know if it's the, the best way how to make something out of all your notes. So if you have any comments to that or some advice, I would be very grateful. I'm gonna let Joe take that one. I was solving a minor technical issue. Okay, yeah, it happened again. I don't know I don't know what's happening that I couldn't unmute myself. Ooh. Okay, I guess now I have the floor. So um, this mute issue is kind of weird. I've never seen this happen before. Um, and now I hear, I don't know if that's Abby typing. Anyway, okay. Uh, Hannah, yeah, it's a good point because I've seen that too. I've, and I've been there too. Like uh, you have 50 pages of notes and they're all multiple, you know, it's kind of like in those movies where the insane person has like, you know, five uh, or sorry, 500 uh, note cards up on the wall with string attached to it and everything. Um, I guess, and maybe I didn't show that very well in my example, or my example wasn't a good uh, example example of that. But I think um, something like, uh, if I can use the word telescoping, you know how a telescope has different sections and they get you know bigger or smaller. So um, you know in your notes you could. You, I think the way I often think about it is you know you have like the the base which is just a. You know five hundred. Uh, no uh, quotations and notes then somehow you have to start uh, grouping things together and so maybe in the maybe you know um, cutting and pasting and putting similar things together and starting to uh, starting to again write around the the notes and starting to gather gather ideas together um, so that you know you have sort of groupings that are the beginning then of something that comes together and is the final thing. Um, so if you're a sort of visual or kinetic learner, you know, you could try visually sort of grouping things together. I know you said that's the color coding as well, but I mean, maybe actually putting them um, in the same space. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, that, that's a mystery, right? Is how, those, how all of those ideas start to come, come together. Um, but I suppose you can, you can try various sort of visual methods for, for doing that. That's the first thing that comes to my, to my mind. Um, like on my, on my uh, notes, you saw that at the top, or, or sometimes, maybe I didn't show it clearly, but sometimes there would be sort of 
larger themes that I would, and I think sometimes I would sort of capitalize them and I would say, okay, like I'm starting to see a larger theme here and these things can sort of go together. So I think I was doing that even if I didn't show it very visually on there. So, you know, that's one way to think about it. And maybe yeah. Abby has. And have you ever tried any like, um let's say apps for that or something because like my friend tried to use ooh, how's it called um damn i forgot like a uh, slack or something like that for note for notes for a thesis or thesis um i don't know if you ever tried that or if anyone has the experience with that well, because i tr i i thought about it but still I haven't tried it because I started my color coding scheme and now I'm testing it. So we'll see so if you have any uh, experience with that. Maybe, um, maybe Hannah, uh, I could show you briefly what I do. Um, and I can definitely link some of the apps, uh, maybe not in the chat, but I'll post it in the, the Facebook if you can follow us on Facebook, the Writing Lab. I'll post some of the um, tools that I use, online tools, but what I could um, potentially show you would be uh, making concept categories is what I call them, but it's just a fancy way of like a writing mind map, right? Where you kind of organize your central themes around the main topic of what you wanna write. So for example, going off William Shakespeare, works, plays, life, rejection, and if you wanted to talk about, I don't know, let's say Anna Karenina, the novel, for those of you who like Russian literature, we could talk about suicide, we could talk about treatment of women, and in the middle here, we would have the kind of seminal text. And this is kind of one way of visualizing it. I usually will actually do this when I'm planning my concept categories or my themes, really, like around my main topic. But what I also um, could show you is, for example, this is an extended third part of my uh, master's thesis that I wrote for um, Western literature. I also wrote it on um, literary forgeries. So it's a little bit on Czech literature and translation, but it, it deals more with the, the Czech rukopisi and how they kind of blended into the history, how Plotsky you know, put them into the, the first Czech history and how the forgery or the myth became literally um, the legend or, or the truth, right? And the, the pursuit behind that and what I was looking at was archetypes so what I was doing is for example this is one of my concept categories as you can see and I was pulling out different uh, quotations because what I like to do is I like to kind of annotate things uh, where I write either my own summary or I pull out some quotations and then I organize it around them um, so for example, this would be my concept category 5.5, the idea or archetype of mothers as maternal or magical women. And then from all the texts I was reviewing, I was looking at different characters from let's say the Odyssey as being, you know, mothers, Kazi, Lubusha, Teta, and then from Eurasek, for example, the same characters. And I was organizing it kind of like that. So it went from, let's say the exceedingly visual map here to um, being on paper a little bit more like this, yeah? And I also kind of like color code things when I put them together. And um, maybe one thing I could show you would be a, a version of an annotated bibliography. I like to uh, show my students, I can um, open it up here. Uh, because this is how I kind of like map my um, my writing uh, when I go about organizing these concept categories. I have to move my Zoom camera thing here. Uh, perhaps I'll stop sharing while I ramble for a moment and I'll log into my IS profile. But um, what I do when I make these um, annotated bibliographies, how they turn into concept categories in terms of organizing my writing, is I will typically kind of look at a source because I want to read it once. I want to read it correctly when I'm when I'm writing uh, for an academic paper, and I want to give the citation for the source, and I want to make sure I have a kind of research question or basically a focus around what I'm writing about. And then what I do is I I begin by writing a summary, literally in my own words, um, and I find that particularly helpful because. I can then kind of copy paste out of my annotated bibliographies or other documents 
directly into the new paper I'm going to write. And it helps me to kind of better organize my writing. And I can um, color code it there as well. Um, and then what I finally do is I will pull out uh, versions of, let's say, uh, key quotations. And key quotations from a text would be um, really something that I don't want to paraphrase. I don't want to change the, the author's original words because I find them to be the best possible way of, of expressing something. Um, and I don't want to kind of take away from that. So um, I'm still digging here for my annotated bibliography example for you. Unfortunately, I've almost got it, but maybe I'll pull this up and I'll turn it over to another question and I'll show it in a minute because it might become relevant later as well while I hunt for this. If I can say one last thing on that topic, and, and that is just obviously everybody has their own process and you can't cut it short. I mean, obviously, you know, if you have a visual scheme and uh, and it's working in some way for you, um, then then that's great. On the other hand, I think it can be very tempting to like play around with outlines, play around with apps, move, you know, color code things and you're not actually putting words down on paper and creating that. So that's another aspect of the shitty first drafts that I think we have to emphasize is that actually means that you have to write the first draft. You have to put your, uh, the way I tell students is you have to put it as you think it might appear in the paper. Go ahead and start that process. In the back of my, your mind, you need to know that it's not gonna be the final version. At the same time, if you if you tell yourself, oh, this is only I'm, I need to do more preparation. I need to to wait a bit longer. I need to play with my uh, <laughs> my outline and my color coding that can also turn into a form of procrastination. So so another I guess another way of getting started is to go ahead and write. Oh, so, OK, uh, go ahead and write a introduction. Go ahead and write an abstract, you know, no, whichever one is more appropriate for the paper that you're writing, or both. And again, you have, you know, <laughs> bless you, Thomas. You have, you know, that uh, that it's not going to be the final version. At the same time, you it makes your it like makes your mind say, okay, this is this does eventually need to be a paper. So I can't pretend that it's just an exercise in in thinking. If that makes sense. Yeah, I actually struggle with that a lot, if I can say something about that, because um, for me, it's really difficult to start to get the words on the paper. So I'm trying to get the process under control by like obsessively making notes and trying to like color code. And then I spend like days and days just color coding, mm -hmm. and it's not moving anywhere because it's just notes. So I think that like, for me, it's really important to learn that I just need to put the words out there and it's not going to be perfect, but I need to start writing and which is like obsessively trying to categorize everything. Exactly, Yana. Nice to see you, by the way. Um, maybe I found what I was uh, mentioning earlier when I say uh, what I mean by kind of getting it out onto uh, an annotated form to kind of then organize it and put it in the final draft before I'll even work with the final draft of a longer, let's say, a text for academic purposes, a thesis or, you know, a review or an essay for my professor. I will do um, the annotated bibliography that I uh, mentioned which um, looks in its final form kind of something like this where i mentioned i'll put my research question at the top i'll add a citation i'll talk about who the source is but this summary of the source really is a uh, key for me in terms of breaking down what it is i want to talk about from the author and this is what i will actually draft before i even go and start drafting my final paper and this is not only from the author or the author's article. This is me interacting with the text and analyzing it. So I'll actually draft this summary and I'll try to put it into some kind of what I could say is a final form be, like before it ever enters my final version of my final paper. Right. So I'll this will happen even before I start to build these kinds of 
thematic categories that I showed you here around language. I'll look at some academic sources and I will start writing summaries of them, drafting some summaries of them in my own words so that then I can like break these down, color code them, whatever works for you, and then kind of put them into a text because um, the way that I do it is very much this kind of quilting or stitching method where I draft my summaries of my sources, I draft my annotations, and then I put that into my final writing. And then it looks like this crazy jigsaw puzzle where pieces don't really fit together and I'm trying to force them to fit together. And I go through and I do this process of kind of editing and stitching them together to try to get some kind of first draft going. But even though this is relatively comfortable for me in terms of being finished, let's say, it's still not comfortable for me in terms of the entire paper or essay or analysis or thesis being comfortable for me. So I even break it down even further, if that, if that makes sense, if I'm not rambling about nothing at that point. Okay, anyone else want to say something about your process? Maybe, I mean, it would also would be useful if anyone has some cool tips for how to uh, start writing, how to get through those first drafts. Oh, I see, oh, I have a secret message. Yeah, um, definitely while you're reading your secret messages there. What I'll say is what I just showed you was kind of an overly complex of organizing uh, my drafting. And the drafting process, while it is a huge mess, is usually unique to the person. You gotta find something that we like to call the flow or what makes you comfortable or what works for you. So even if you write a sentence here or there and then walk away from it, like I showed you in the beginning with my kind of living draft, this idea that, um, the academic papers start from something grand where we sit down and we write our essay or our thesis from start to finish is virtually non-existent and extremely difficult to do. It's extremely, it's a huge heavy weight on the mind to kind of sit there and think, okay, I'm going to write this thesis or I'm going to write this paper for this professor. So this kind of crazy complex way I just showed you, for example, of annotating a, a source, a, a journal article or an essay, and then taking that annotation and then categorizing it by categories and then taking the categories and putting them into a final draft and then stitching that draft together. That's my process, right? So it could be helpful for some of you, but also it might be a little bit too, too much, too systematic for others. I don't, I definitely don't think Joe works in the same way. I'm not sure. Um, so essentially it's going to be a little bit different for everybody. And it's about trying out different kinds of drafting processes as well to see what works for you. And also uh, what I think we haven't really mentioned so far in terms of the drafting process is, it's not just about the computer or the piece of paper and the pencil and you. It's also really about the state of mind. Um, as Lamont mentioned, it's not gonna always just kind of sit down and flow out of you, even one sentence, not a paragraph, even one sentence. It's not gonna just sit down and flow out of you and think today, I have to write this paper for my professor. So you do have to give yourself quite a bit of time, but also at the same time, you have to like allow yourself to write quite shitty academic papers as well. And you have to try out different drafting processes. And then for the mental aspect of that, for me, it's really important that I have, let's say a time that I allocate for myself it doesn't have to be the same time every day. You don't have to make a pedantic calendar, but okay, I'm going to sit down for an hour. I'm going to kind of clear my head, put on some calming music or create silence, whatever works for you. And I'm going to try to write just a few sentences, even if they're totally terrible. Nobody's going to see them, remember, yeah? And then the next thing I need to create my flow or my kind of process is I need a space. Yeah, sometimes that could be your bed. Sometimes that could be your desk. For a lot of students, it's actually the library. They need this kind of structural, structuralized environment to, to access that ability to feel productive or to get into the flow 
So it's about actually creating the entire environment around your writing or your drafting process. It's not always so easy to just say, okay, I have my computer, I have my piece of paper, my pencil, let's go, let's try to make some shitty sentences. So give yourself a space, give yourself a time, give yourself maybe even a break or a reward. I've written for five minutes, now I'm gonna have a piece of cake. Now I'm gonna watch 10 minutes of a Netflix episode whatever kind of system to kind of reward positive rewards uh, for yourself for trying to get some kind of things done. Maybe now I'll stop rambling. Um, do we have any more questions or happy experiences or terrible experiences about the drafting process <laughs> from anyone else? Uh, hello guys. Uh, for, for Actually I use the same map as uh, Joseph about uh, that is a mess, total mess. But uh, before that uh, mess, uh, I say it's, uh, it's good for me, for example, in my opinion, to read uh, a, a lot of literature, uh, as much as you can. Uh, two days, three days, or five nights, it's okay. And uh, after that, take a break. Without any notes, without anything. And after that break, for two days, maybe maximum three nights, uh, try to start writing, but from your memory. Just uh, shut up your laptop and from your memory. And it's kind of useful. But I, I don't know for somebody, but for me it's useful. So I just share my. Thank you so much. I definitely think that's useful. It, it definitely works like that for me sometimes as well. So thanks for sharing. Who is working on a draft at the moment of something? One, two, three, four. The faceless people in, in the Zoom crowd. I'm so sorry, I can't see you. But maybe you're also working on drafts at the moment. Um, no, with, with breaks. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're struggling getting uh, started, another one of the, the more helpful tips I've found for me and that I recommend to my students uh, a lot is to actually start a journal, which seems cumbersome, like, oh gosh, another thing I have to maintain every day. But the journal can actually be the permanent draft that nobody ever sees. And the idea is not that I need to write the journal to get the writing done, but actually the journal can become a kind of writing habit. So if you remember from Lamont, an exercise in just writing anything about anything, even if it's completely terrible or even if it's nonsense, or even if you're writing about the trip you took to this really beautiful place from a photograph you have on Instagram or Facebook, just the idea of writing something every, every so often, every week, every day, whatever time you set for yourself. If you get yourself into thinking about writing as a kind of habitual process or something that could even be cathartic or stress relieving for you, it can actually help you overcome those blocks of getting started when it comes to the more heavy writing, the ones that do have the audiences of your professors or even your um, thesis review board, or, or even if you're going to publish a paper one, eventually one day, if you can get over those kinds of blocks of, oh gosh, I have to start, because you're already in the habit of starting. Yeah? I don't know how you feel about journals, but. I'm a fan of a really terrible journal. I, I think it's also a psychological barrier. When you start to, to write, it's like affect you too much about uh, uh, opinion, uh, professor's opinion. And also maybe some of your colleagues, if you're in discussion group. For example, for me, in uh, academic writing, uh, I have the subject. So it's a kind of also affect uh, what, what people will think about your sentence and grammar and so on and so on. But uh, I have a question about, uh, uh, is it any tips, for example, for handbook? Because handbook is approximately 70, 80 pages, like an easy handbook. Because uh, uh, my field of study is finance. And uh, it's kind of uh, difficult to translate the financial stuff to so uh, like normal and natural language. And uh, with example, it's, it's uh, more easy. For, for example, I use examples when I explain something. And uh, do, do you have any suggestion or kind of that? 
for, for future because there is a summer so I, uh, I think something to do <laughs> thank you uh dimitri what can you say a bit more about what you mean by hand you mean you have to write a handbook for who uh i mean for for example for this summer uh, i think about uh, master thesis and uh, it's a lot of work and uh, the topic about portfolio and uh, i would like also to Right. Um, I, I think, I, I'm not sure, but uh, it'd be very good if uh, everybody know what exactly is portfolio in simple way, without uh, some of uh, examples with uh, mathematical stuff that is, uh, you know, uh, like uh, plus, uh, plus uh, two plus uh, two is uh, five and uh, explain it in more easy way. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, I'm glad you said the word examples. This is the word that is like always on every feedback that I give students, examples, examples, examples. Um, the power of a, a good example is so important and it's what, I think some students have this mindset and it's also important what you said about psychological because I think we put, Abby and I talk about this all the time, we put, uh, and many of our students put academic writing in this box of, it's a special kind of writing and um, you know it can't be it can't be expressive it can't be creative it can't be all these things we tell ourselves that it can't be um, but in fact there's a lot more there needs to be a lot more um, a less compartmentalized relationship I think or at least uh, I think it's helpful for me to have it less compartmentalized because when you're thinking of a good example to get across a point in an academic paper. You might need to, for a moment, go outside that strictly, I don't like to call it academic language, but to, to be more specific, abstract, sort of abstract theoretical language. Uh, you need to ground your ideas in examples in real life. And that's, it's, it should be clear, especially to you, Dimitrio, in finance, I mean, where we're talking about, we are talking about theories, but we're talking about the real world. We're talking about real money, right, that people are exchanging. So, um, so yes, that's good. Uh, you can use, what, so one thing that I suggest is um, what, I, what I mentioned earlier, it's, it's telling your idea, if, you, if you're trying to write, if you're trying to write something that can be understood by a general audience, say it out loud. Say it out loud as if you're speaking to someone in conversation. And then, who knows, right? As you're, as you're speaking it, type it down, record it maybe, and then transcribe it after you're done. See, see what happens. See if you're able to express the, uh, the, um, the ideas more clearly if you're imagining that you're speaking instead of writing. Because again, I think some people think I'm writing, it has to be academic, it has to be professional, okay? back off slightly. Imagine you're just uh, telling these concepts to a friend. How would you describe it? Write that down, type it down, then go back and say, okay, this is too casual or too um, uh, personal or too friendly. I need to, for this assignment, for this thing, I need to translate this into more academic language. So then you, but what you have there is the basic structure of what you wanted to say and you said it hopefully relatively clearly. And you can build on that because if you, the problem is if you uh, don't have that basic structure of here's what I'm trying to say in the most basic term, then the, the problem is you could end up creating nonsense because you're trying to be too uh, academic and too complicated. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, I got some uh, way. For example, uh, I can discuss with uh, my friends uh, who is not in economic or in finance field of study, for example, uh, and explain them uh, with examples and uh, to see the reaction, uh, how it's work on them. If that is clear, so I can use, for example, that. And if it's not, uh, I need to uh, work more on that. And also, it's kind of an uh, uh, advantage to surprise the people with. Uh, a uh, good result, for example, for of some companies, maybe, I think, mm -hmm. and situation economic, of, for example, with coronavirus economy around the world is not so good now. Thank you so much for your explanation. I can also jump in. Um, I would definitely look for maybe like a few models of this kind of um, 
of, of writing as I think of it like how to explain finance for dummies, for example. Um, that could help also. Uh, but what I would try doing would be to um, achieve, I think, maybe what it is you want to, to do in terms of your language, which is not like this informal way of speaking, but not this inaccessible kind of too droll academic or um, let's say formal register of speaking. You want to get something in the middle, like a neutral, a mix of the two. So you could start exactly using Joe's advice, just writing it exactly how you would say it. You could use some speech to text so you don't have to transcribe it even later. You can just edit it out. And then you could insert maybe some uh, more sophisticated explanations where, th where they need to be. Or you could write, for example, some uh, brief little introductory few sentences of basically, this is what you're supposed to do. This is kind of introducing the very complicated financial theories. Um, and then maybe the last thing I could suggest, which is something that I show my students every semester when we talk about hard sciences uh, or scientific writing, let's say. There's a, a really nice video series from um, physicists, I think theoretical physicists, I don't know, I'm not sure, Michio Kaku, um, if you know him, yeah? And he gives this really great uh, talk or discussion or interview. He's a brilliant, brilliant professor. He's, you know, a physicist, it's way beyond my comprehension. And he starts talking about how he can explain extra dimensions to a general audience who has no idea what he's talking about. And maybe finance might be a little bit more accessible to people than extra dimensions or physics. And what he does that I find particularly useful or relatable to everybody and really like hooks your reader in from the beginning is he begins with a metaphor. And he starts with the, the koi fish in the koi pond. And he says, imagine that you are a human being looking at a koi pond and you see a koi fish swimming there. The koi fish with his eyes swimming in his pond, he only ever sees what exists in his world. And this is all he ever knows. These are his dimensions. Yeah. You as the human being, you can observe him. Imagine if you picked up the koi fish and you let him observe your world as a human being, it would be a completely new experience to him. So it would be a completely new dimension that the koi fish would take on. And he would say, ah, suddenly the world is not just my koi pond, but it's also this entire world around me, the, the human world, yeah? And that's how he explains how we as humans could potentially understand extra dimensions around us that we don't really perceive yet, which I found to be a really cool metaphor for a um, physics theory that I couldn't personally comprehend myself when I wanted to look into the technical descriptions or let's say formal way of writing um, about the concept of extra dimensions. So maybe some of, some of those ways might work. The, there's, there's always a lot of power in a very relatable metaphor when you wanna introduce a complicated concept to people. So writing simply and how you would say it, you know, to your friends getting their feedback, also potentially using some metaphors when you find something to be really inaccessible to the average person and how they would understand what they need to do. Um, I find that to be really helpful in, in difficult technical writing like you would need for a handbook of, of how to do something. I sent a, a link in the, in the chat because what you said, Abby, reminded me of this great uh, video series on YouTube. There's many different videos. I just chose one of them, but I love it because um, it's experts in science, scientists, uh, explaining very difficult concepts on multiple levels of difficulty and they have uh, one person as sort of the audience for each of them so they start by explaining things to a, a primary school student and then they move up to the through five levels to an expert a peer a colleague um, and uh, try to so this this one the woman is explaining gravity and I love these uh, videos because it really um, uh, shows you how she um, adapts her, because one, one uh, um, sort of, what do, you, what do you want to call it, criticism or one sort of objection that students sometimes try to tell me when I say, write simply. And of course, you know, sometimes people who are uh, um, uh, graduate students and uh, scientists, they say, yes, but the concept is very complicated. I can't write about it. 
uh, simply, um, or I'll I'll betray or, um, the the truth. You know, well, to some extent that's true. However, I think these videos are a great lesson in how, if you watch it, she's able to explain the concepts, but without without um, uh, misrepresenting them, without saying something that is um, untrue, right? So uh, I think that's a great response to the, <laughs> to that. If that's if that's in your head, like oh, but I can't. There's no other way to to explain it. It's extremely complicated concept. I have to make extremely complicated sentences. No. <laughs> and if you tried it for your maybe your five different audiences, like ranging from educated expert in your field all the way down to your grandma at Christmas dinner you could maybe try that on your colleagues and say, all right, which one is the most comfortable in terms of the language I want to use for the technical manual? Which one to you says, I want to keep reading this, but also I understand what you're trying to say when you want to educate me about this, about this process. It's a really cool exercise to try. I also have to do it for my um, dissertation research, try to explain it for five different levels of, of audiences that I'm writing for. And it's, it's really difficult, but it's also really cool to kind of break it down but stayed true to the original concept as, as Joe mentioned. Thank you so much. I'm very appreciative for your help. Maybe we have time for one more comment or question if anyone wants to. Comment or say something. Don't be shy, just ask. I mean, yeah, I, that's what we're here for. I like your attitude, Dimitrio. You should uh, come, and, come and teach uh, in my classes, and inspire the students to speak. OK, well, um, we've, we've been at it for, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, yeah, I sent that. I tried to see how those reactions worked earlier. So now I see how they work. Okay, cool. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. And thanks to everyone who, uh, who joined us today. Um, Hannah reminded me earlier that I should uh, give a little advertisement for, I mentioned earlier the, the writing lab. This is the sort of um, thing that Abby and I are trying to start. The, the basic concept of the writing lab is that we will offer consultations, one-on-one -on -one consultations for you. If you're working on uh, a draft, uh, an assignment, a CV, a thesis, a anything, uh, an email to a professor, um, an email to anyone. <laughs> basically, we will, we'll, if you're working on any writing project and you want to consult with us, I mean, it basically works very similar to what you saw today, we'll, we'll sit down with you. Um, we'll uh, talk about your writing project. We'll ask you what, you're, what you want to do, what you're trying to do, where you're at. Uh, it can be at any uh, point in the process. And um, we'll, we'll give you about 45 minutes uh, if, you, if you want it and need it and um, uh, get, your, get your shitty, draft uh, moving forward or your shitty notes or your final almost perfect draft. So um, we are still working on the sort of official Masaryk webpage uh, where you'll, you'll be able to see uh, what we're all about. But in the meantime, we have the Facebook page, which most of you, I think, have known about. Um, and um, so you can contact us there. You can send a message. You can uh, send a message uh, to us personally. Um, you know, we're on IS, uh, Abigail Mokra and uh, Joe Lennon. We're here and um, send us a message and say you'd like to, to meet and um, we'll find time to do that. Of course, this summer it's going to be uh, online, but hopefully we'll, we'll be back um, face to face uh, relatively soon. So, yep, that's, that's us. Uh, again, uh, we hoped we hope to do this um, 
Oh, yes, thanks, Hannah, for the hand clapping. We hope to do this again. Yeah, maybe in another couple of weeks, we'll, we'll think of another uh, topic. And, and um, so maybe you can join us for that. Or um, in the meantime, uh, yeah, and we both teach uh, classes as well. If you want the full, the full Abby and Joe experience, you can join us. I think the one that, that, are, that is open to everyone is the class at Faculty of Arts. We both teach um, a, a regular, uh, every semester writing class um, at the Faculty of Arts. So join us for that class. Join us in the Writing Lab. Join us for the next Writing Gab. And Abby, any final thoughts? I just sent the uh, course code in the, the chat to every one of the one you mentioned for the Faculty of Arts. But yeah, definitely. Uh, we're still working on the on the final website, as Joe mentioned, but it'll happen very soon. You can find us in IS. Typically in IS, when it's a, a contact semester, we have office hours still happening where you can drop by um, kind of at any time. And we're kind of waiting there to help you with, with projects that you have going on. You can send us an email as um, some students that I have um, have done with me and I'll, I'll be sure to respond. Uh, and I know that Joe will as well. And then our Facebook page recently is I think the most promotional and we have Joe's cat, the most promotional um, in terms of getting in touch with us or seeing what we're all about. So there's a brief description. I encourage you to read it because it, it kind of explains how we, how we do our writing consultations how we try to advise you and help you. Um, and it emphasizes a little bit that we're not an editing service because that would be an insane amount of work for just us two trying to get this, this project going off the ground, the laboratory. Um, but we are there to help with things like drafting or with things like writer's block or how to proceed or connections or logical transitions or concept categories or main ideas, whatever it, whatever it could uh, potentially be, finding models. We have a little small library going there as well in our office that we have. So definitely get in touch. Um, if you have a Facebook, uh, definitely like us there and share us with all of your friends. We're so happy to meet all of you. Thank you for joining us on this uh, dreary, in Brno, at least dreary Friday morning. And we hope to see you next couple of weeks, a couple of weeks from now on our next topic. So, bye everyone. Thank you again. You're all awesome and happy drafting. Thank you for your lecture. Bye everybody. It was so, so, so impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Demetrio. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna hire, I'm gonna hire Demetrio for my, <laughs> as a we, cheer, we cheerleader need, uh, for my. Some other consultants, no? We need some, some other languages going on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's in Zoom. It's uh, futuristic, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Okay. Bye, guys. Okay. See you now. Bye. I'm gonna end. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Anna. <laughs>